Go ahead, uh, Richie. Okay, uh, so thanks everyone for joining the February 15th webinar. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of housekeeping items. Everybody is on mute. So if you do have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat and then we'll get them addressed after the presentation, or at least we'll try to get to most of them. Um, so without any further ado, I want to introduce Oken Duyar, who is a product specialist at Master Builders Solutions Canada with over 25 years of experience in the cement and concrete and admixture industries. He's spoken at multiple association meetings on various topics, including fiber reinforced concrete, self-consolidating concrete, and concrete durability. He's worked as a consulting engineer for bridges, bridge rehabilitation projects with the use of SCC and UHPC, or ultra high performance concrete, which he'll be speaking about today. And he's been involved in developing blended cements, uh, concrete with over 100 years service life, uh, UHPC designs for various projects and applications. He's publication, he has publications on concrete durability, early age cracking, SEC, and admixture technologies. And he currently is sitting on the CPCI Technical Committee, which uh, just released a SEC best practices publication. So please welcome Oken Dior. I will pass over uh, to him. Thanks, Richie. Uh, thanks for everyone to join. Uh, I will just talk about ultra performance concrete and design development and production of it, and mainly Canadian practices and also the uh, Ontario applications too. And let's start up with the what is UHPC? Okay, the presentation kind of frozen, I guess. Here we go, yeah, it's working. Ultra performance concrete is designed, actually developed early 1990s uh, with the high vibration and kind of uh, try to replicate the steel. And what we are looking for is, we are looking for high strength concrete, high durability and high structural properties. And a, then we take a look at the Canadian practice. We have CSA 823.1. Uh, in 2019, we have an NXU and we have a, a 120 MP a minimum compressive strength limitation came in. And there is no strength requirement in in, in US though. Uh, that's why we are a little bit more advanced than them. And also we are looking for tensile strength around 15 to 30 MP, which is dramatically high compared to conventional concrete. And that uh, tensile strength and high compressive strength brings us the fracture, uh, high fracture energy ductility, which we'll like to, uh, to use for different engineering applications. So it's the specialty of UHPC is we have a very low water binder ratio, which is 0.2 or lower. And that allows us lower porosity, high durability because of um, finer particles packing. And these kind of concretes can survive through any kind of environmental exposure, so which we will discuss shortly. So why ultra performance concrete? Uh, this is Chicago Waker Tower, uh, early 1990s, roughly 100 MPA. And they weren't able to place concrete uh, with old technology. Uh, they were just using buckets. Taipei was similar in time range, 1995 in Asia, and then Burj Khalifa early to 2005, six, uh, when it's built up and 660 meters of uh, 90 MPA concrete and rest of it is steel structure. So as we look at it in our Kingdom Tower in Saudi Arabia is building up, it's over thousand kilometers, just concrete itself. So there's a huge, increasing demand of structural properties. It's not just only height, but also like Brilliant Tower in Tokyo, Japan, they were able to achieve 156 MPA in cast in place concrete. So there is a huge demand for high performance because we have a, a environmental issues, we have a economical issues, we need to figure out what to do for concrete. So when we take a look at the history of concrete, commercial concrete was in the market uh, over a century. So in this chart, we have water binder ratio on the uh, horizontal axis and vertical axis is the compressive strength. So we were roughly around like 
25 to 67 MPa for normal concrete. So with the introduction of silica fume in Europe roughly around 1980s, we got high strength concrete, which is lower water cement ratio and almost 100 MPa to like 50 to 100 MPa compressed strength range. And self SCC came up from Asia and well accepted in Europe. So it just went up uh, slightly lower uh, compressive strength uh, and higher water demand with high workability. And then uh, Lafarge introduced ductal, structural ductal uh, around two, early 2000s. <clears throat> and it's 150 to 270 MPa. Actually, I was in Transportation Research Board meeting in 2003 when they introduced North American branch. That's why for me it's over two, after 2000. And UHPC uh, commercially was available in Europe and Asia. Uh, even we, we were able to go up to over 200 MPa compressive strength. And Tacto is a brand in, from Germany, so they were able to come up with their version. So it's kind of in between high performance concrete to uh, UHPC, but they marketed their products somewhere around that range. And in Dactyl recently, they came up with their architectural uh, version, which is lower strength, but it, it just works for the architectural purposes. So there is not much structural uh, expectation with those kind of UHPCs. So when we take a look at the high performance concrete versus UHPC or uh, High performance concrete SCC and SCC over 100 MPa and UHPC. What are the differences? What's going on? First of all, there is a coarse aggregate in all concretes, but not in UHPC. And there is a portion of sand and there is water and powder content. As you see, as the per, uh, engineering properties or strength uh, properties are going up, powder content goes up and water also uh, coming down or staying somewhere where it's supposed to be. And that's important change through the uh, concrete technologies. So what's important for us is what are changing in composition. So normal concrete, high performance concrete or SCC or UHPC. So raw metal quality goes higher and higher because we have a higher expectation of strength and performance. So binder always changes, but we need more uh, SCMs in high performance concrete. We are looking for high performance uh, durability. And also when we take a look at the aggregate size, uh, normal concrete, we can go up to 25, 25 or higher, uh, but as you go higher performance, you, need, you don't need that much of uh, core socket. So that's kind of uh, different than what we used to learn with conventional concrete, but uh, the main challenge in concrete design is the aggregate uh, mortar interface, and we don't want to deal with it in high performance concrete. So and also we have fibers in UHPC. That also brings us to ductility or engine properties we are looking for. So on the I just want to explain you where, where 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 is UHPC versus SCC. So mixing complexity and handling ch challenges, handling of the raw material challenges actually on the uh, horizontal axis and the amount of cementitious and fines on the vertical axis. So when you put SCC, it actually it's very simple. When you add up SCC and fiber, which is a kind of high performance concrete, it's slightly more complex because you need to be careful about the water, the mixing becomes a kind of challenge and you need more fines to carry those fibers. In UHPC it's way more challenging and it also needs a, those kind of UHPC performances can be achieved lowering water cement ratio and lowering the amount of force that also increases the compressive strength and ductility and fractional capacity of the concrete. So when we take a look at the ductility and tensile strength of UHPC, let's say conventional concrete in deflection and fractional load curve, uh, when you have a crack in conventional concrete, there is no residual capacity in your tensile strength. So it's very low, actually. 
when you take a look at the fiber reinforced SCC or high performance concrete fibers, there's a little bit of residual capacity because of fiber existence, depending on your type of fiber and dosage. But there is something you can, you all, we are trying to bring it to the concrete. And when you take a look at the UHPC, we have a really uh, better than concrete performance in terms of stencils uh, performance. So the key things over here is after initial crack, in fiber SCC, we don't have that much of capacity. We, are, we, have a, we have something, but it's not enough to design. But in UHPC, we have something additional, which we call structural hardening, that gives us a lot of tensile capacity and uh, ductility. And uh, fiber SCC or fiber reinforced concrete is not that bad, actually. It gives us something. We can use it in some basic applications, but it's not like a structural hardening properties we are looking for. And uh, this is one of the studies we did for uh, fiber SCC. Uh, so we did a fiber SCC and we take a, uh, that sample for testing just to see if we can get the tensile hardening with a, a fiber SCC. Yeah, we can get it. As you see over here, there is a tensile hardening, which is kind of reasonable, not great as, well, as much as UHPC, but it's good enough for most of the applications. And when we take a look at the, a section in after splitting the sample we see fibers are still working like some of them are pulled off some of them are broken but in return it's really a full section and as you can see after a three percent uh, deflection uh, of the full span it's still holding itself it's it's better uh, it's as good as the reinforced section so that allows uh, new technologies to bring uh, for structural uh, works so what is the difference between normal strength or fiber reinforced versus UHPCs? Uh, what we are looking for is we are trying to use fibers in a thick section of a concrete. So top portion works for compression and bottom portion with the distribution of fibers looking for tensile properties. But in UHPC, we have a very thin section that works for that purpose. So how does it look? Actually, it's like this. As you can see, a thin section, roughly three meters span, can hold handle four, four, four guys and without any like very minimal deflection, which is reasonable for most of the applications. So fibers are important in UHPC that gives us all the structural properties we are looking for. So what are the common types of fibers in UHPC? Uh, for structural applications like bridges and uh, some uh, connections, we are using steel fibers. And we also have a uh, bridge girders, waffle decks. They are also they are all using steel fibers, and we also have polyvinyl alcohol fibers. So polyvinyl alcohol fibers are unique from Japan. So they do have different properties. So you need to be careful. They are also be used for kind of fire resistance, but their structural properties are also phenomenal, uh, very close to steel. Just to show you that, uh, I'm going to share with you some of the European studies done. So we used 100 kilograms of steel fiber, which is roughly 30 meters of uh, total volume. And also we tried to match up the same performance with PVA fibers like 13, 23, and 30, 34 liters per cubic meter. So when you take a look at it, a crack opening is in, in the bottom in tensile strength and the load is on the left ver uh, vertical axis. So as you see, UHPC gives you uh, tensile hardening with steel fibers. But as you go higher with the polyvinyl alcohol fibers, you can get very close to the steel fiber performance. So this is important to know because some applications like architectural UHPC, you don't need to use steel fibers uh, and you can use PV polyvinyl alcohol fibers. Or if you need to use uh, for a structural application that requires fire resistance, you may need to use blend of it. But also polyvinyl alcohols gives you some other uh, engine properties too. So this is a study done in Europe again, uh, and it, they use uh, three different types of pure cement in a UHPC design with a blend of uh, silica fume and slag. Okay, and they try to compare two cement pr properties in terms of strength and tensile properties. So. So when you take a look at it, 
uh, cement A, B, and C, these are the same water cement ratio and same mix design, same amount of cement in, in the mix. And as you can see, uh, cement A is roughly on 60 MPA and cement C is roughly on 80 MPA. So that's good though compared to conventional concrete, but in UHPC applications, we are looking sometimes higher, like uh, 80 MPA for steam curing or something like that. So that there, there, are, there are different expectations from UHPC. In seven days, they are roughly on 120 MPA. That's great. They're already, in seven days, we are already somewhere around the, you know, Canadian UHPC definition in terms of compressive strength. So in 28 days, though, when you take a look at cement A was the shy one on the first day, but in 28 days, it's over 160 MPA. And the C was kind of uh, the fast one uh, for uh, one day strength, but in 28 days, it's the lowest strength one. And it didn't gain that much of strength after seven days. So that tells us, uh, sorry, and the flexural strength is somewhere similar, so I cannot see the screen well. Sorry, I just need to move the, uh, yeah, here we go. Sorry about it. So when you take a look at it, uh, cement A gets flexural strength capacity regularly increasing over 40 MPA in 28 days. And cement B is, 35 MPA, but it's not as, as good as the uh, cement A. And when you take a look at the cement C, uh, that also gives us somewhere close to cement A in flexural strength. So in UHPC design, there is nothing straight. You need to check all the options, all the alternatives, and not every cement gives you the same results, or not every cement composition will provide you the similar performance in terms of uh, compressive strength and flexural strength. So you need to be careful about how you are uh, selecting your raw materials. So that also brings us uh, the super plasticizer or super P. So there are different cement types and different cementitious compositions. So you need to pick up a proper cement, uh, super P or plasticizer. And then uh, the fillers may be different. So there are a lot of impacts on fillers because we are looking for a fully compacted section and different climate conditions like cold weather is the uh, mix design is different than hot weather design and fiber is different as we see on the you know uh, flexural capacity if you have still fiber you have different mechanism of action for mixing and if you have pva it's different and also the uh, if you are looking for a high really high flow then you need you need to be careful about the water control and super pit selection and also mixing is important and slump retention how are we going to handle the uh, workability of the UHPC and I will show you all the videos in, in a while so don't worry about the uh, definitions and everything and we need to have a rheological model to flow the UHPC with fibers in it that's also important to pick up a proper plasticizer. So when we take a look at the UHPC market, we have two types of UHPCs. One of them are called pre-packed or pre-bagged mixtures. This is very common with the bridge applications. Okay, and what we do, like these are all the pre-designed materials and they do have all the engineering reports, the RCPT and everything. and what we see is there's a lot of reports on FHWA, Federal Highway Administration. You can take a look at it. There's different batching methodologies, different workabilities with different brands. So there's a lot of varieties. Mixing time properties are all like plant conditions, all provided by the producers. They are great to work with, but they require uh, support from producers uh, when we are starting to, uh, you know, placement or you need to do some mock-ups uh, and there's a lot of details with the Minister of Transportation Ontario for those kind of uh, proprietary products. The other alternative uh, which is kind of more trendy now is local material based mixtures so you can develop your own UHPC with your local materials. It lowers the cost and you have lower embodied carbon because you're, you're using local materials. Uh, you may have a tailored mix based on what you have. You don't need, you don't need 
uh, fancy mixers, you can use whatever you have, as much as the mix allows you. And you may have custom modifications for project or sections you may not you may want to use for the UHPC, but it requires local ex expertise to develop UHPC mixes. So there is a lot of uh, publications on Federal Highway Administration. You can go to the website and download a couple of them. When you read through, there is a lot of information. And uh, you need to have verification testing, testing, uh, and you need to have high QC effort. As you see on the SCC uh, and fiber re reinforced SCC example, UHPC is on the high end. So you need to have control on fresh and hardened concrete properties. So that's why it's more complicated, but uh, you know, it's a give and take for each you know occasion or each project, I guess. So what do we need? So what do we do for UHPC design? So first of all, you need to have chemical optimization. What does it mean? You need to have you need to have local cements and supplementary materials and their combinations, and you need to come up with water content. So it may be ternary blend, three cement tissues, or binary blend, so two cement tissues. And based on that, you need to pick up the polymer, as I say. And that also brings the mixing intensity into discussion. So what type of mixer you have, what kind of cement tissues you want to use, and what kind of polymer you need to pick up. These are important uh, discussions to be done before you are in theoretical phase, before you start any kind of uh, practical uh, trials. And then there's a physical optimization based on your cementitious and supplementary combinations. We take a look at your particle size distribution and we take a look at your aggregate, sand, or whatever you have as a micro filler part, particles. And then you just combine them in an optimal flow uh, or particle pe packing methodology just to avoid a, you know, a voids and also come up with a proper consistency. And then we go for performance testing with fibers and flow adjustments because, as I said, there's changes with the time, like a winter is different, summer is different for, in, you know, UHPC mixing. We, ju we just need to set up uh, your mix for all those options. So after a collecting local materials, we need to be sure that your materials are high quality and sustainable. So we don't want any kind of material to pick up. You may have a, a magic potion from somewhere else, but it's just for like 50 cubic meters, but it's not sustainable. You cannot spend that much money just to get a one mix to work with. And when you have all the materials, high quality kind of collected, we can make it best environmental friendly concrete. And our, when we decide on the materials, we decide on uh, material properties. And then we start developing trial mixes and we play with the mixes. And I will show you what, what I mean, uh, just to see where we're at uh, in terms of strength gain. And after everything is finalized, we go for full scale testing, mixing sequence, timing, and how much flow we can maintain. And do we have problems with the skinning? And I have a skinning video I will share with you that it's different than all the other concretes you have seen before. So, and then production mockup is important, and you need to train your casting team because it's it's a different beast. And like a, we have this similar problem with the self consolidating concrete. So when you start from conventional concrete to switch to self-consolidating concrete, people are not used to placing it and finishing it. So you need to have different methodologies to train people. So as I keep saying, UHPC mixing is the key. Why it's important, first, we have a lot of cement issues and we have no coarse aggregate, but we don't have water either. So what happens, we start mixing dry materials, and as soon as you introduce your water to the mix, there is a conglomeration of cementitious particles and it locks the whole system. And that's where you need the high shear mixer and, or high efficiency mixer. Then you just start you know, uh, dispersing materials and you allow your polymer to work. And then you can achieve a kind of flow. That takes longer time than normal concrete. So let's see how it works. 
So as I say, this is a UHPC after all the dry materials are added and cement and sorry water and admixtures are added to the mix. And as you see, it's, it looks like nothing. You need to give a high shear and you will see a little bit of a balling, uh, like a smaller size and that balls will get larger, like a baseball size. And you will, you will start seeing lumping. And as you see, now we start to release the polymers and it starts to work. That's the, uh, you know, mixing part of the UHPC. And as you keep mixing, you start breaking down the early hydration products of etching guides and it gives you the flow. As you see, it gets workable uh, every time. So don't expect like a regular concrete, you know, a, in SCC, it splashes everywhere. This is, we don't have water in this system. So it just looks like dough. So the other thing in a UHPC mixing is what kind of mixing technology do we have? Do we have a standard, you know, a mixer or do we have a high efficiency mixer as if on the right? So these are important changes for uh, mixing sequences and type of sand, uh, angularity of sand, uh, water absorption of sand, and hardness of the sand particles are quite important to be studied. And what type of fiber do you want to add? When do you want to introduce that fiber to the mix is also important because when you have interlocking like a, uh, because of the cement issues and lack of water, and if you bump your fibers up front within the mixing, and if you have a low shear mixer, and it's recipe for disaster, it's not gonna work at all. That also affects your hardened properties too. So uh, the type of polymer is important. And if you have a low shear mixer and low, low acting polymer, that's not a good combination. So you need to be careful about which type of polymer you need to select for which type of mixing. So the other important thing in UHPC is mixed temperature because uh, what we see is, especially in, in summertime, uh, because of low water cement ratio and initial temp mix temperature and longer mixing time, it just heats up extremely high. So mixing technology, mixing sequence, polymer selection are kind of important to keep in balance to control the mix temperature and mixing time. So this is a study done in a Germany, uh, published in Kessel 2004 report. So what they did is uh, they have the density on the horizontal axis and a vertical axis is the compressive strength. And this is a UHPC roughly less than one millimeter a coarse sand size and 25% silica fume. And they use 2.5 and 3.5% steel fiber in different uh, combinations. And it's low water cement ratio. These are the information provided by the you know, pub, uh, publication. And when you take a look at it, so this is a regular pan mixer. And out of same mix design, you have lower densities and lower compressive strength versus high shear intensity. So that tells us how important mixing for UHPC production. So if you don't, if you are just looking for a basic, a, you know, uh, 130, 150 MPA, pan mixer may work for you. You don't need to change your mixer. You may need to modify some of the uh, quantities with your mixer, but in return, if you need really high end a UHPC, then you need to have really high end mixer. As you see, both density and also the compressive strength varies from uh, both types. And as I said, you need to be imp your mixer becomes important. Then you need to have a control mode of mixer, constant data recording, and based on your mix, uh, these are uh, this information is from uh, Europe. That's why they do have a little bit of coarse aggregate, roughly up to four to six millimeter coarse aggregate size. And that also that's also important, how much energy you put in and what's going on. And uh, these are the 
cut sections. And as you see, if you have coarse socket in the mix, and this is up to eight millimeters, you have heterogeneity in the mix. If you have a fine sand, then you have more homogeneous section, which we prefer for UHPC sections. By the way, in Europe, they use the coarse socket for vertical members like columns or pre-stressed members just because they are worried about the creep and shrinkage and I will discuss that topic later. So as I said when you develop the base mix we would like to try something like low and high you know uh, this is a mix we developed for another customer in Ontario and we, roughly we had 1020 kilograms of uh, 1020 and 0.22 water cement ratio mix. We just set up for that and we tried everything 0.2 up and roughly uh, 30, 30 or 50 kilograms more or less cementitious just to see where we are at. You know, what's going to happen if you have a problem with the cementitious? What's going to happen with the water if you make a mistake? You know, just to see what uh, where we are at. And when you take a look at seven day results, uh, these are phenomenal because we got already 105 MP in seven days with the 0.2 water cement ratio, even though we plan, uh, plan to use 0.22. But uh, the cementitious is 1020, that's great, but more cementitious did not give us any strength. That's also important to realize. So that gives us a, how the cement water and admixture chemistry balances itself. And curing is important. Uh, there's different methodologies of curing. It's not just ambient curing. There's accelerated curing. There's additional curing for UHPC sections. You need to replicate everything because uh, in performance, we are looking for a really high compressive strength and flexural capacity and also tensile capacity. Then you need to replicate what you have as a curing on the lab conditions. That's why QC efforts are kind of high with the UHPC. And after we got the final results, you may need just 100 MPA for seven days uh, for this application. And you have like three mix designs. So then you can work on the cost. You can look for the mixing efficiency or the workability retention. These are all features you, can, you need to try differently. But, you know, uh, it's always, you know, good to have those kind of ideas. What's going to happen if I use more or less with the UHPC? And also, it's uh, I read a lot of UHPC publications. Most people just focus on packing density. It doesn't give you always the best results. Just pay attention, 0.2 water cement ratio, 990 kilograms of cementitious or 1,020 kilograms of cementitious. 1,020 kilograms of cementitious with the packing density of a 0.796 gives you the highest strength. But you cut 30 kilograms of cement and you have the similar packing density, but you're not getting any strength. So it's not just one dimension. There is a, a lot of dynamics in UHPC you need to consider when you are finalizing your mix. So production challenges of UHPC is way more complicated. So mixing time is seven to 15 minutes. Mix temperature is important. You need to keep it under control. And your cementitious composition is also important. That affects your mixing time and your temperature and also the other engineering properties too. So plant specific, you may carry the same concrete with a flying bucket, which is a system in precast plants. We have, you may have cranes, you may have tucker, tucker belt or tucker systems. You may have track mixers to carry. So how are you going to carry empty? And you need to maintain your workability and all the engine properties. And section specific properties are quite important. You may have a coarser sand, finer sand, different sizes of fibers, or you may have large pieces, which uh, one batch will not be enough for you. So those are the section specific challenges of UHPC. And when you take a look at it, curing becomes a, another factor for production. How are you going to cure? Is it going to be a, like early curing or late curing? How it's going to affect your, your structural properties, operations? And UHPC mix, when you have a large piece, you may, ha you may need to have multiple mixes. So you need to be careful about workability loss. And mixing time has to be under control with the temperature. And you may lose your workability when you're placing it. 
and you may have skinning problems which causes uh, debonding of the uh, member and fiber consistency and location uh, of the fibers are important so we need to have homogeneously distributed fibers in multi directions and if you don't pay attention to those details then you may have cold joints So, as I said, thermal curing of UHPC is very unique, and uh, we have three con different types. Ambient curing is one of the common one, but we don't prefer UHPC to be, you know, ambient cure because of high cement issues and low water cement ratio. The hydration takes way longer time, and you may not be able to hydrate all of the cement particles which we use for the you know uh, strength gain and the uh, stability thermally induced accelerated curing you may have a low temperature of uh, you know uh, curing on uhpc sections that that's a fresh uhpc so there is that also applies for the you know uh, accelerated curing practices of the normal concrete so you cannot go over 60 degrees Celsius, but set time is important. And UHPC set time may vary up to uh, 12 hours to 24 hours. So that's all important to understand. You know, then curing conditions has to be maintained properly. And post-thermal uh, treatment after a certain strength, uh, you may need to, you know, heat up to 60 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Celsius. And what you do when the concrete is fresh, when the pores are open, you use a lot of additional moisture and heat to hydrate leftover cements. So you get additional strength gain with the help of uh, thermal treatment. So when we take a look at it, a low temperature heating is kind of most efficient or uh, environmental friendly. And these are important for higher performance UHPCs like over 250 MPa or you know, some 180 MPa applications. So what's the difference with conventional concrete and UHPC in use of structural members? First of all, uh, the, the, this is a publication of Dr. Tadros, uh, and he is the lead researcher for PCI US. So what they did, they developed a span for the uh, bridge sections. And Dr. Tadros is the inventor of the NU sections, if you are familiar with the uh, bridge girders. So when you take a look at it, NU girder is roughly Eight, eight feet high and nine inch deck thickness. And you can replace the same section with the uh, UHPC. So look at the slenderness of the web. So instead of roughly six inch thickness, you are like four inch thickness. And you are using one feet extra, but look at the span capacity of the section. You increase your span capacity roughly 60%. So you don't need a pier in the middle. You can go directly with the 85 meter span and look at the uh, dead weight of the section. So it's like the uh, 40, 45% light weighter than conventional and you, and when you take a look at the deck, uh, you have over 150 years service life versus conventional deck has roughly 25 to 30 years, depending on the salt exposure. So what happened uh, with, when you compare conventional concrete and UHPC. Dr. Wu is one of the researchers of uh, UHPC, uh, very famous in UHPC world. And he has a bridge section, actually he can span over 100 meters. So that's his study on the conventional concrete and UHPC uh, trials. And first of all, use less material, roughly 40%. And embodied carbon is roughly 20% less than conventional concrete. And you have Relatively, you have 20% less carbon footprints on the bridge section. And when you put the service life in, you have roughly a similar 80, 85% of the commercial concrete. So that's a great material to work with actually, just for bridge sections. So Milan Polytechnic did some work on the UHPC. So what they did, they had a precast, a, conventional building, they replace it with the UHPC. So they were able to remove one uh, one frame out of the whole building. And based on their res results, what they find is RCPD is dramatically low for them, for their mix. And they check the uh, current iron, iron penetrability uh, for, based on the Danish methodology, and it's negligible. It's not even like more than a millimeter. So maximum penetration of water was undetectable. 
So it's way better than conventional concrete. And when you take a look at the PCI results uh, with recent uh, Dr. Tarros's presentation and Dr. Lowell's presentation, actually, and com compressor strength is phenomenally, extremely high, and tensile strength is phenomenal. And we have very good uh, engineering properties, and we have very good durability properties besides shrinkage and micro strain. So I just want to share the uh, Milan Polytechnic results. So compared to conventional concrete, it's it's high. And what we see is depending on your cementitious composition and the particle packing properties and fiber content, you may have different shrinkage properties, but it's Generally, it's higher than the uh, conventional concrete. You need to be careful about it. And the creep properties, if you uh, apply any kind of steam on uh, UHPC sections, creep properties are always better than the conventional concrete. Higher, but better in terms of uh, <coughs> uh, in, in service case. So as I said, CSA has an NXU in 2019 version, and we have two different compressive strength classes, 120 and 150 MPA in 28 days. In addition to compressive strength, we have durability classification, 50 years, 100 years, and 200 years. So as you see, there is abrasion of loss, salt scaling, absorption, in RCPT, and sulfate resistance. And when you took look at the RCPT, if you are familiar with the any kind of MTO job, in 28 days, less than 100 Coulomb is really a great number to achieve. And most of them are pretty close to uh, 60, 80 range. We rarely see around some, something around close to 100 M Coulomb in 28 days, and that also brings a lot of a you know resistance to scale and abrasion loss too. Uh, the other important thing with the UHPC is when you are specifying and trying to use, you need to have a material identity card. So it's important if you have a pre-blended UHPC or pre-packed UHPC. So you need to, uh, in that uh, identity card, you need, they will tell you what kind of cementitious composition do they have and their storage requirements and conditions and how long will it be usable for your, for your uh, you know, project. And mixing instructions, probably they will ask, most of them are asking for technical support because they don't want you to kind of fail with the mixing. And curing type and conditions are important. As I said, set time is very unique. And if you have longer set time, then you need to have uh, you know, uh, longer curing or later curing applications. And you need to have all those information. You may have a plant design. So that's kind of different because it's kind of uh, specific to the plant. So you don't need to tell everything about the mixed components. You just need to say what kind of cementitious composition or total cementitious you have. You don't need storage or shelf life because it's plant produced. And mixing instructions are important to let people know how what kind of mixing do, do you use. And curing is also important. We, ex, we use accelerated curing of 60 or 90 degrees Celsius so people can understand what kind of treatment uh, did the product received and that, I did a lot of those kind of uh, actually I did two works with the UHPC field cast so we are we are asked to build up a precast deck and join uh, join fill with the UHPC and these are different sections from Federal Highway Administration and these are mainly widely used in uh, Ministry of Transportation projects. We are, we, uh, they are quite open to those kind of applications. And this is one of the designs we developed in Ontario for bridge. Oops, sorry, I stopped it. So that's how it looks. Sorry, I'm trying to kind of control the volume of the stuff, uh, if you are hearing. So as you see, you feed from one end, it goes through the enclosure and you need to see the flow and you can see the steel fibers and consistency of the UHPC flowing through the you know, enclosure. That brings us a lot of uh, benefits. And uh, right, compared to conventional concrete, we have, you need a really small section that you know, bonds both precast panels in structurally. 
that's important. And it, as I said, there is a new PCI approach with Dr. Tadros again. They came up with different sections and look at their spans and uh, modifications of current uh, precast sections. The key thing is, for instance, like a commercial inverted T-beam is important for us. You have this like almost less height and less weight. It's almost 40% weight of the conventional system. And it has the same structural capacity. So in, 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 in terms of height, you can have additional floor by using this kind of technology in like after eight, seven or eight floors that gives you additional floor. That's a lot of uh, construction cost reduction, a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of benefits with the uh, use of UHPC. And the, another one is very important for the, uh, especially in Saskatoon, we have a lot of uh, conventional piles and there's a lot of marine structures using uh, conventional piles. So the main problem is the corrosion or sulfate resistance. You can use uh, UHPC sections and with the half weight and same structural capacity, that brings you a lot of uh, information and you can fill up the uh, voids with the conventional concrete if you want additional capacity. But it's a lot of, uh, in terms of carrying the carrying and driving uh, uh, piles, UHPC piles is a big advantage for industry. So I just wanna show you how it looks when we are developing. So this is one of the trials we did. So as you see, it's like a dough, but it has rough, this mix has roughly around 200 kilograms of fibers in it. And you can see the fibers poking up. And look at the flow and how paste can carry the fibers. You see the fibers are pushed through the, with the gravity of the matrix, but it's stable. There's no leakage. All the bubbles are okay because we are using too much chemical in it. It's just because we are trying to push the UHPC to flow. And the same mix after like 25, 30 minutes when we are taking, oh sorry, uh, when we are taking the flexural beam, look at the mix. I'm just gonna, as you see, it's flowing, but as as not high flow like before. And it looks like almost dying down. So you can see layers of UHPC coming up and you can see the skinning building up. This is a good skinning because a mix can still handle those kind of flow. And you can see the still fibers still flowing with the mortar. As you have higher hydraulic pressure with the mortar or UHPC, then it flows better. So, I'm just going to go to the end of the video. So look at the last. So it's just almost stopped. It's the same mix, by the way. And you stop adding and you look at the skinning on the right end. You see the skinning? It's still working fine, but it's on the verge of you know being cold jointed. So these are important for UHPC. It's different than any conventional concrete, very unique a property we need to follow. And this is in. Uh, after we did everything, this is an H pile developed in Ontario. And I just wanted to show you the video because you can really drive the section. Uh, this is not a high end, like this is roughly around 170, 180 MPA UHPC. It's not like over 200 MPA. But in return, uh, this is the finished product. So we were able to drive. We, had, we used a little bit of timber when we were driving the T35 drive, and it just burned off. And you, as you see, nothing broken, just the, corner, the corners are chipped off. And the, the other, like if you have a cold drain problem, like the other pile we have on the right, now it's gonna shatter the uh, pile, pile head and it's not it's it has we can't you can use that one so you don't know if you have any cracking somewhere down below the section that's kind of no no for the, those kind of application that's kind of field a, a proof like a application proof of your section and the other use of UHPC is mainly architectural and we have wall panels and left in place forms this is a project done in 
Ontario and uh, we, uh, they ship the panels to Hawaii. So these are the uh, panels we developed for them. So it's supposed to be a, a, like a Hawaiian a leaf. And uh, if you can take, if you look at the right side, you can see the thickness of the section. And the architect wanted to have kind of vision like uh, having a ceiling like this for a uh, building. And that section was carrying roughly two feet of uh, SCC concrete. So. so we have two different wall panels, uh, perforated ones and the thin wall panels. So perforated ones are out of like how much section you make it void. So if you have high void ratio, then it's a more challenging for structurally. And thin wall sections are like, look at these panels are roughly uh, 3, 3 3.5 meter long and roughly 1.8 meter uh, width. So look at the flatness of width, like one inch thickness. And you have high strength properties. And this one is also the same. When when you try to use it on a project, so this is Hotel X downtown Toronto, uh, perforated wall panels, and this is another restaurant entrance. They ship it to Alberta actually. So that, that's how they look in, in application. So tin section allows you to ship it everywhere. That's kind of economical benefit for everyone. And this is another project in Concord. And this is, and look at the finish, the no bug all, very extremely fine finish and freestyle resistant, uh, very good, you know, uh, architectural panel. It's also perforated, but when you have illumination on it, it's really phenomenal. That's all from my side. Hope it's uh, knowledgeable or it gives any kind of perspective to you for new projects. That will be great for us. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Sokin. That was uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, there are a few questions here, so um, I'll just try to go through all of them. Uh, first. Um, Dr. Hooten asked, uh, the change in materials on slide seven was interesting, but what about the differences in admixtures? I'm not sure if you address that later on, but um, I guess versus traditional concrete, what are the, the admixtures that you use in UHPC? We don't change the admixtures. We are using commercially available admixtures. The key selection is based like we, I try to rely on mainly on like a cementitious composition selection that uh, and also the mixer is, has an, a lot of importance. We pick up the proper size of polymer like short side chain, modern side chain or long side chain. And then that gives us a lot of uh, benefit to handle the concrete when we're producing. Other than that, it's just conventional stuff. Uh, only thing uh, like in Japan and Asia, they do have different polymers for UHPC. We don't have that kind of different differentiation actually, yet in North America. Cool. Um, and for the heat curing, you mentioned temperatures above 70 degrees Celsius. So how do you deal with uh, DEF at higher temperatures above 70 degrees? So we are not curing concrete when it's fresh with over 60 degrees Celsius. We are, uh, those kind of additional heat treatments are roughly around like 70, 80 MPa of concrete. So we already have the primary hydration products, uh, you know, formed. The pores are still open for us. Then we go crazy on the uh, high heat and uh, moisture so that we can hide it, whatever left over unhydrated in the cementitious set portion that gives us additional hydration uh, and strength gain. So the Key difference is we are not going crazy over 70 when the concrete is fresh. But, uh, we are trying to keep the concrete in, in, in like accelerated curing around 40 degrees Celsius till it's set time. After set time, it goes 60. That's the first type of uh, accelerated curing of UHPC. The other one is you need to wait for 70, 80 MPa and then you go high heat treatment. Cool. Um, and have has there been any studies on using uh, Portland limestone cements in UHPC mixes? 
Uh, you can try, but uh, as you can see, UHPC is very sensitive for any kind of change. Mm -hmm. And if there's limestone addition supposed to be done, I would like to control it on the uh, plant side. Yes, you can use it, but if there is any fluctuation in the uh, consistency of lime, uh, limestone filler, then you will have different volatility on the UHPC, which will bring a lot of, you know, fresh and hardened properties, a, you know, risk, we, which I don't want to carry, which we, these are very expensive mixes. So they're not so cheap. So we will prefer to use those kind of additions separately with with a con full control on the plant side. Yeah, and that kind of leads into this next question. So if uh, a lot of the cement does not hydrate, then why not use more mineral fillers to reduce the cement content and heat generation of the mix? Yep, we do that. Yeah. That's also like, as, as I said, there's a lot of variances in UHPC mix designs. Uh, you can go up to 50% supplementary cementitious materials and fillers. As again, it, it needs to be correlated with the proper design of curing too. Because when you have those kind of uh, additions in the system, so you have a lot of surfaces, you don't have enough cement to bond them. So it's 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 not that straightforward. Okay. Um, and do you know what the approximate hydration percentages are uh, with different curing methods? Uh, there are a lot of studies on that, and it's all depending on your cement efficiency. Uh, the cement selection part of the UHPC is the key for any kind of hydration rate. So you may have a high blain cement versus low blain cement. Okay, high blain cement, you think that it's going to work for you better, but in return, uh, low blain cement works better in UHPC than high blain cement. So hydration rate is better with the low blain cement so it's different uh than normal conventional concrete so what we do there are ternary balances we check so we try to understand how much water needed to hydrate full cement okay and then we go to the design and we try to uh, you know estimate amount of hydration and we go from there for strength gain and all the you know blend, the blending process Cool. Um, and just to, I, I guess, be a little bit more specific, when you say polymer, are you talking about acrylic polymer or uh, Super P? Let's um, say Super P. I, I don't want to go into that detail because there's lo lots of chemistries you can use. And acrylic polymers are like, if they're providing any kind of uh, air in treatment, we don't want it. We are looking for high strength concrete. So if the polymer generates a lot of uh, foaming or additional air structure as in the uh as in the other products okay uh, like the mm, fiber reinforced applications we don't want to go that direction with the uhpc it's completely different structure okay and a question from the mto does master builder solution have a commercially available Ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete in Ontario. We don't have, we don't sell. We work with the precasters to develop the mixes. Okay. We provide the technology with with the, with our customers. That's all we do. Yeah. So the the finished product would it, I guess be what's yeah. on. Uh... There are some products like we, they, but these are all designed for different applications like the windmill tunnels or those kind of stuff. They are over 120 MP repair mortars or kind of mortar systems, but they don't have any fiber in them. So those are just designed for specifically for that purpose. We can modify it, but it's not really, you know, it requires a lot of training Mixing is a challenge. I used to work with the technical team in Europe uh, developing those kind of mixes. We tried a couple of different bridge projects uh, for footings. Uh, it takes roughly three to six months to develop those kind of modifications. You need to go through all the engineering testing. You know, mm -hmm. It's not that easy. 
Yeah. I prefer develop, developing a mix with a you know local precaster so that it's easier that way. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, well, thanks a lot. That was all the questions that came in. And uh, again, thanks for your time. It was really informative. Thanks very much for everyone. Have a good day. Thanks.